And that said, we are live. Uh, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. This is December the 15th, 2019. And our guest today is Damien Angelica Walters. Hey, Damien. Hello, how, how are, are you? you? I'm good. Tired. Good. Um, <laughs> so, congratulations. You just moved into a new house, right? At a housewarming party yesterday? Yes, yes. We uh, settled on the house on November 15th, moved in on the 16th, and um hosted thanksgiving dinner nice. the morning of thanksgiving our water hot water heater died which we knew <laughs> it was old so we kind of knew that it would happen soon yeah soon thinking six months a year not um you know a week and a half and then yesterday we had a holiday open house uh housewarming party so yes today i've just been sort of you know cleaning straightening up getting the house back in order and then sitting on the sofa for a few hours just um being quiet zoning out so yep. I, i'll get off the house topic but uh, um you just said before we started that you're next to some woods yes is that right how mm-hmm. how many acres or is it is it real deep woods or what is it it is it's a uh, lock raven watershed property so oh, there's great. a reservoir um i don't know i mean i don't know how many acres but you know we took the dogs today for a two mile hike on, yeah. on one of the trails um it i mean it's what's nice is that because it's protected there will never be anything built. There is a house sort of that way that I can see. Um, Probably the Blair Witch. It. To yeah, to that in that direction, it's just woods down to the water, um, oh, wow. and it's great because, like I said, it will never it'll never be developed. Right, no. and no no carnivorous bears or anything like that. <laughs> no, just lots of deer, lots of deer. We had um, carnivorous in deer the yard yesterday. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the creepier feelings. Uh, to, at least for me, is at, at, in the middle of the night, pitch black outside. There's no streetlights, anything like that. And you, you look. You're on the edge of a woods, and you look into the woods, and you really can't see past a few feet. And you know, it's always this little thrill of, you know, anything could be in there. Looking back at me, and I wouldn't know it. You know, so <laughs> this is true. I'm, I'm trying to make your stay there more. Uh, oh no fun. i love it i love it um when we well you're a horror writer yeah <laughs> yeah we came to look at the house at um in the evening and so when we walked outside you know there are no street lights and it's dark and looking up at the stars and was like yeah this this is cool. oh yeah that's great there's so much light pollution in most areas where th- it's it's interesting this neighborhood is a small neighborhood there's only a handful of streets it's the houses were built in the 80s and yet we're like we're it feels like we're almost in the middle of nowhere like the country except we're not i mean a 10 minute drive and we're yeah. in the middle, middle of chaos and restaurants and shops and everything that you need so it's it's this it's this illusion of being isolated yeah which is wonderful you know um when i was young i think i was 27 28 a friend and i decided to go out in the middle of the night to visit this place this is up in iowa and the place is called 13 stairs and it's supposedly haunted you know whether it is or not you know that was it was just something fun to do right Mm -hmm. and right in the middle of the woods in this cemetery it's it's exactly what it what it what it says it's 13 steps that go up this little hill and they're really not necessary i don't know why they were there but you know of course all these superstitions grow up around them and everything and i remember when we were almost ready to go getting that feeling i was at the top of the 13 stairs looking into the woods deep deep woods and you know it can be a pretty chilling feeling you know Mm -hmm. so so anyway the woods can be you know if you you stop and you hear nothing and you see nothing you just see trees it it can be a little even if you're on a trail because if you can forget for that for that minute that there is a way out there is a sense of Oh, crap what if we turn yeah. the wrong way <laughs> what if the trail just disappears you know yeah. and in certain areas f- from the trail you can see houses i mean and, and there's you know a stream so you could find your way out but still but it's there you're like oh thank god i have gps on my phone you know <laughs> yes <laughs> which 20 Until, years ago you know, we didn't really <laughs> well exactly and in proper horror you know novel story fashion it would stop working Yes. The minute the trail disappeared. Or be set in the 70s or something, or the 80s. 
Uh, so, uh, anyway, um, Rick Lay is here with me. Matt Carpenter is here with me. Guys, you want to do a, a short intro, and then we'll talk to Damien. I'm Mike Davis with Lovecraft Easy, Chief Cook and Bottle Washer, and uh, Rick. Rick, I'm just a writer. Leave <laughs> it <at> that. <laughs> just a writer. Uh, Matt. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm one of Mike's unpaid assistants. That's right. I, I have a bone to pick with you about that, by the way. You're overpaid. Anyway, <laughs> I've got a prize to give away. This is a hardcover, author-signed copy of The Weeping Season by Sean O'Connor. It includes a bookmark. So, if you want to be one of the lucky, the lucky person to win this prize, uh, what you do is you go to Gmail, you send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com and put weeping in the subject heading, and in a week or two, we'll randomly draw a winner. It could be you. They don't have to go to Gmail unless they have a Gmail. Well, they could go. Yeah. Easingprizes at gmail.com and put the, what would you say, put the title in the subject? Or just weeping. Weeping, right. Um, okay. well, like I do when I get my paycheck from you. <laughs> what paycheck? Um, Damon, That's the point. <laughs> Damon, can you give us, can you, for those out there who don't know you, can you um, tell us a little bit about yourself, a short bio maybe? Short bio, okay. I am the Or long author. bio, whatever you want. You're oh, the guest. Oh, <laughs> Well, it started in 19... <laughs> okay, seriously. I was uh, born I... in... <laughs> <laughs> exactly, in a little town in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> we had no running water. <laughs> no electricity. Yeah. It was a really sad story. Um, seriously, though, I am the author of the recently released The Dead Girls Club, Paper Tigers, and the short fiction collections Cry Your Way Home and Sing Me Your Scars. I've had lots of short stories published. Um, a few have been nominated for the Bram Stoker Award. And that's it. <laughs> I live in a house uh, with my husband and two rescued pit bulls. Um, yeah, that's I enough. Was, well, I was looking to see if my memory was correct or not. Mm -hmm. And I know you've written a lot of short stories um, and you've, you've had several collections, right? Mm -hmm. There's several collections. Um, but this is your first novel, is that right? No. No? It is okay. not. It I is my one. first hardcover. Ah, okay. All right. But I also had a novel called um, Paper Tigers, which I recently That's got. That's right. So that is um, that is unfortunate. I mean, you can still, I believe Amazon still has copies of Paper Tigers. You recently got what? I'm sorry. Got my rights back because oh, the publisher okay. went um, um, belly up. Yeah. So... Is it, Which is sad, but I mean, it, it happens. It was a smaller press. Yeah, running a small press is hard. Um, yes. Do, are well, there are there was, Kindle editions of this available? Paper of Tigers? Paper Tigers? I have, I, uh, probably not. Um, I mean... I'm going to start seeing $1,000 copies of Paper Tigers <laughs> on Amazon now. You know how they do when like, it's really limited. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I have a few copies, and I, I have an ARC. And I have like two copies. Um, yeah, so I guess I should hold on to those because maybe one day somebody will be like, oh. "Well, you should, but you should also have um, somebody republish Paper Tigers for you and, and get the Kindle version out there too." You know, so you know, I could. Um, not that you need my advice. I mean, but. I haven't. You know, I haven't even looked at the novel in forever. So, and I think it came out in two thousand sixteen. So if I if I were to do that, I'd like start editing it from the beginning and the end. <laughs> I, I just would. I would have to. I couldn't just re-release it. Matt, it feel free then... to insert a, a comment about Willem Pugmire if you want. Well, that's what he did. Every practically every time he published a story, he extensively revised it. This is one of Matt's pet peeves. It's not a peeve. It's just it's like okay, look. You know the composer Bruckner? He was constantly tinkering with his symphonies, and multiple editions have been released, and the differences might be minor, but if you're an aficionado, they're important. Yeah. So it's, it's just something artists do. You can't leave the work alone. It's oh, once it's gone out into the once it's gone out into the world, 
okay, there it is. But if it comes back home, maybe you want to give it a brush over, give it breakfast. I don't know. Oh, uh, problem in is readings. Me. I ad lib stories. Like I make edits on the fly at readings. Oh, cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rick. I was saying the problem was Willem was not so much that he, I, I don't mind if you tinker, you know, add a little comment that you wish you had put in, but the whole ending might change. <laughs> the whole beginning might change. Yeah, I got the whole middle stuff. might change. You know, it, it's like, where do I go to, what order do I read these stories in? It's like George, George Lucas with Star Wars. What is the definitive version? No one's gonna know till he dies, you know. Then, then finally, it will stop being tinkered. But maybe there's never a definitive version. Maybe there's like the 2018 version, the 2019. Like, I mean, it's true. Because in theory, you could just keep revising them until until you can't anymore, and then. Well, I think Matt's comment. Correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. Was, um, hey, instead of doing that, give us some new new material because we like what he's what he's doing, you know. Well, the other the other point on that is though is the artist is the artist yeah. you know and sometimes like just for example Laird Barron doesn't really write supernatural Lovecraftian fiction anymore he wants to be known as a crime author you have to accept that enjoy what he gave us and mm -hmm. try to enjoy his new novels if you can because they are pretty damn good so if you as the artist decide that you're going to perhaps revise a novel that was released three years ago that's just the way it is and we'll have to be happy I think fans can't suppose that the the writer is uh just writing to them they're serving their own muse i don't even know that i'm phrasing that right i think that's right and at the same time let me point out i'm not this isn't criticism just uh it's kind of fun to talk about uh, different writers react in different ways to when a when a book comes back home to them you know so um so yeah, yeah what what, what was paper tigers about and then we'll move on to the dead girls club it is a very um, sort of gothic horror story about a disfigured woman and a haunted photo album. In a nutshell, that's the easiest way to talk about it. It's about trauma and healing, uh, acceptance, but that's kind of at its core. It's about all of those things, but the main character, Allison, uh, is very badly scarred from a fire, and she stumbles upon a photo album that um, basically she falls into, like Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. And, you know, that was sort of my my take on falling into a, another world. And inside the photo album, she is no longer scarred. So. Boy, I like that premise a lot. Um, someone just wrote on the live chat, that Amazon has 12 copies left of Paper Tigers. I don't know how much they are, but but yeah, get them while you can, people. So. Yes, because once they're gone, they're gone. Yep. So. Uh, on the other hand, there are lots of copies of the Dead Girls Club. So yes, there are. Are you going to get a paperback release sometime t soon, too? I, or I think that's the plan. I think it depends how it sells in hardcover. Honestly, oh, okay. I mean, face it, publishing is a business. If it... If it yeah. does well, um, I would I would wager to guess that they will release a, a trade paperback edition. Um, I would assume trade paperback as opposed to mass market. I could be wrong, um, but okay. They're telling me that they're around four dollars and eighty five cents for Paper Tigers right now. So okay. all those well, that uh, makes sense because the, I know that Amazon, according to the publisher like amazon bought copies so amazon can i guess sell them for whatever i probably will never see a penny but um but you get exposure you're paid an exposure yeah. oh that's right <laughs> i'm gonna let my the uh, the mortgage company know that after yeah the yeah yeah no, i don't need to pay the mortgage this month i got a lot of exposure as a writer yes. so or, or can i just pay i'll just tell everyone what a wonderful bank you are <laughs> i'm sure that will go over Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. So, um, let's see. Uh, uh, the Dead Girls Club is available in hardback right now. It's available in Kindle. So, after we talk with Damien, you can download it right away and start reading it if you want, if you like Kindle. Let me put you on the screen here um, okay. so that they see. There's the 
for those who are listening in their car later, um, Damien's holding up a copy of the Dead Girls Club. Um, is it is it available on Audible.com yet, or will it no. be? Okay. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Um, okay. I'm not 100 percent sure. Not every book is. I'm just curious. I I like audiobooks a lot. So, um, tell us what the Dead Girls Club is about. All right. It's kind of a spoiler it's free. About, you know what? I'm just going to read the official cover copy. That works. That can say it better than than I could. And honestly, I would probably just try to ad lib this from memory and do it poorly. So, in 1991, Heather Cole and her friends were members of the Dead Girls Club. Obsessed with the macabre, the girls exchanged stories about serial killers and imaginary monsters like the Red Lady, the spirit of a vengeful witch killed centuries before. Heather knew the stories were just that until her best friend Becca began insisting the Red Lady was real and she could prove it. That belief got Becca killed. It's been nearly 30 years, but Heather has never told anyone what really happened that night, that Becca was right and the Red Lady was real. She's done her best to put that fateful summer, Becca, and the Red Lady behind her until a familiar necklace arrives in the mail, a necklace Heather hasn't seen since the night Becca died, the night Heather killed her. Now someone else knows what she did and they're determined to make Heather pay. They say time heals all wounds, but the Dead Girls Club will have you wondering if the ghosts of the past are really gone for good. And there's this line that caught my eye, red lady, red lady, show us your face. Yes. Oh, that sounds really creepy. Yeah. That, is, that is what the girls, that is part of the chant that when the girls are um, summoning the Red Lady. Okay, now let me get ahead of myself a little bit. This mm -hmm. really sounds to me like it would work in uh, visual presentation, like uh, TV or movie. Mm -hmm. So, it does, doesn't it? Uh, mm, inquiring minds want to know if you've had any inquiries. Because <laughs> that really um, sounds like that would be a great visual. I have a film agent, and um, as far as I know, that she is working on... She is working on that. I don't. There's nothing in the works. Nothing specific. No contract. No money. Um, but you know, that's what film agents do. They they try to get the TV or film rights, sell them, because then we all make money. Whether or not anything is made, so we'll see. And not again, it probably boils down to, in some ways, I'm no expert on this, but in some ways, if the if the book is selling like hotcakes, then probably mm -hmm. is going to be more interest in turning it into a say a netflix series or a movie or whatever yes so. i mean the, the better a film a book does the more visibility the you know the more of the chance that that it, it's optioned yeah. for film tv again whether or not it's made i mean lots lots and lots of books are optioned for tv or, or film and are, never see never see a screen it seems uh, to me that more are getting made even from smaller presses because we're sort of in this again a golden age of television with services like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu um, suddenly it's not a choice between okay is this book going to be made into a movie or not it's are we going to give this book you know a mini series or not because it's it's done more often these days and I, I think that's great you know um, I you know I I would I would love it it would be really great to have something you know, on the screen that originated in my brain, but you know, like I said, knock on wood. Yeah, and uh, you know, also there's there's so much detail that gets lost if you if your only choice is a movie, whereas a mini series you can you can explore uh, the book more. I think I, I think movies short stories work better for movies because a short story. You know, you've got like a one story arc. You you don't typically have the subplots and the and so it's all very contained and fits you know an hour and a half to two hour movie beautifully. Right. Um, with novels, you tend to need more time than just two hours. You need, you know, maybe you need the Netflix series. You need, um, you know, and yet not always. I mean, look at Bird Box. That was a movie, and I yeah. thought that they handled everything kind of beautifully. Um, you know, certainly there were some things that are in the book that were not in the movie, but I don't think to the detriment of the story, it, it worked. And, you know, honestly, I think that comes down to to the writers and, and directors, producers. I mean, 
you know, it's always... You, you know, and it always cracks me up when, um, especially sacred cows like Lovecraft or or uh, Lord of the Rings or what what have you, you, you have these certain group of fans that say, well, I don't want them making a movie of that because they're going to destroy something that's, you know, uh, precious to me. And I just think that's, that's so ridiculous. It, a movie or a miniseries, even if you hate it, doesn't change one word on the printed page. Exactly. You know? No, it doesn't. I mean, so. if someone takes takes your favorite book or your favorite story and makes a movie, and then then maybe you love that movie, or they take your favorite movie and they make a remake, and then they make another remake. It it does not. You can still have your original. Right. You know, people were freaking out over Ghostbusters. Okay. Yeah. They didn't ruin your child. How did they ruin your childhood? I love that. You ruined my childhood. Time machine. <laughs> Flip, go back, and maybe, you know, rip the ticket from your hand before you could see it. They okay. did not. You're just pissed off because you think it was perfect, and, and you're upset. But, you know... You know, it's fiction. You can not. pretend like it never happened if you don't like it. You okay. Know? Oh, exactly. now, okay. Now, okay, my question would be, Jackie Gleason, he never got pissed off because they made the show The Flintstones. Which was basically just the honeymooners in Bedrock. Now, when they took uh, okay. the cartoon based on the TV sketches of Jackie Gleason and turned it, then they turned it into a live-action movie, like the third iteration. I do think that was a sign of impending apocalypse, you know, because there's only so far you can go with this. But anyway, I have a question, if you don't mind. Um, no more questions. You are a really you come across to me like a very seasoned professional like you really kind of know you, you know what to do and, and you're talking about markets and stuff like that i was wondering when did you start getting interested in writing what what was your education what got you going oh my gosh okay um so when i was a little kid my dad would take us to the library every friday and i would emerge with a stack of books usually i could barely see over them so you know, I was just a huge reader. As far as when I started writing, I don't know, but I remember that I tried to sell my books to neighbors, walk around the apartment complex where we lived, trying to sell them. Um, unfortunately, I was targeting the kids that I played with. Well, kids don't have money, so, uh, but, but I can remember that. So there isn't, I don't, you know, I mean, I know that people say that's a, that's a cheesy answer from writers. Well, I started when I was a child, but I mean, we do. We read and we write, you know, as, as kids, and then we grow up and keep doing that and eventually think, well, maybe I'll try to get paid for this. And sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't. Um, you know, for every who, who story you that I've written and sold, I mean, there are plenty that haven't. And I think as as you as you go on and do this for a few years, it, it's, I don't know, you become very pragmatic about the business. So what was your big break? If you did, you have a big break, or was it just lots of little steps that, looking back, it, that you could see a path, but it was like, sort of unexpected that you got here. No, I just you know work hard, just just work hard, and and you know it's all steps. Um, you know I'm the Dead Girls Club is probably my most mainstream, you know it's piece of fiction. Um, it's part mystery, part coming of age, part supernatural. Um, with it being the first hardcover release, I kind of feel like this is, it's not that I've leveled up per se, but I feel like this is a big step. And so we'll see what happens from here. Um, but I want to, you know, hopefully I keep going up because I don't, I mean, certainly Stephen King is at the very top, you know, of his game and, and I guess he really has no place to go because he's at the very top. But I think, you know, the rest of us, yeah, we, we can keep going. And it's not just in a, in a, okay, well, I want to, you know, sell a million copies. I mean, sure, that would be fantastic. Um, mortgage, new house, yes, <laughs> please buy my book. <laughs> um, but I, I think some of it too is in terms of storytelling and, and, and writing. And I just want to keep, I want that to keep going up and up. It's not, it's, not just the the accomplishments it's also i'd like to look at something i write in a year and see the growth from then until now um or from now until then i read an interview uh several years ago with michael shannon you know the guy who played uh, uh zod general zod in man of steel 
and you know yeah. that that movie got him a lot of recognition of course he'd been acting for years mm -hmm. um he was I in world war empire too right I beg yes your pardon. yeah yes. I think so. he was in world war empire that's where i saw him for the first time yeah, he's a great actor, and uh, I think the question, it's been, like I said, several years, but it was it was more or less a question of, like, do you feel like you've made it now? And he said, I said that he felt like that was a myth, that, you know, you don't turn around and now you're, you know, you've quote-unquote made it. It's just, you keep progressing through your career, and hopefully good things happen, and maybe better things happen, and, you know, maybe make a living off your acting or whatever I, it is. You know, I think your visibility changes. I think yeah. that we, you know, that, that I mean, that's that's what you want. You want to grow your audience so that, you know, maybe the first few stories that you write, you only have a handful of people who read them. And, and as you go on, your audience increases. I mean, certainly there's some people who their debut novel puts them on the map and they have hundreds and thousands of, you know, of, of fans. And that's really, really fantastic. Um, and a lot of us, that's not our path. That's not the way our careers go. You know, for every for every um, Aaron Morgenstern, there there are you know, and um, I'm drawing a blank on her name, but uh, her book, The Ten Thousand Doors of January. Those are both um, fantasy, magical realism. You know, make her her book is is making a huge splash. And I'm drawing a blank on her name, and and I don't know why. But you know, there's there are plenty of other books that and authors that, that don't, that maybe it takes a little while for them to find their audience. And, and you know, there's a lot of mid-list authors where, you know, our audience is a little smaller and that's okay. I mean, it, it takes, I mean, my gosh, the, you know, not everybody can be the the number one bestseller. Yeah, oh, but that's not, number. that's not, um, that's, a, that's sort of gravy. If, if you know what yeah. I mean. It's mm -hmm. nice to have extra acclaim and extra money, but, you know, there's plenty of authors who have been writing for decades that are not household names, but they're, you know, they're making a living at it. They love what they're doing, you know. And they have, they have a win. dedicated fan base. Yeah, exactly they have right. have their audience. So, and, and you know, I, I mean, that's, isn't that, that's, that's kind of why we do this. We do this to tell stories, and hopefully there will be people who want to hear those stories and who want to read those stories. So, so regarding your development as a writer then, um, since you've been reading for as long as you've been writing, are there influences that you can point to and say, these are people whose books I really like and I tried to, uh, not, I'm not going to say imitate, but you know, um, digest and then maybe use that as uh, inspiration to go forward or are there writers you really like? I warned you, know, you Damien. Um, that would be one of the questions. <laughs> yep, I know. So I'm going to start back to childhood Damien. He used to read um, these books called The the Worst Witch or something by an author named Ruth Chu. I still have those books. Um, in They're actually in, on a bookcase in my guest room. Uh, I used to read Lois Duncan. Then oh, I, yeah, read, um, I also read Encyclopedia Brown, which somebody mentioned the other day on a Twitter chat. And I was like, I hadn't thought of those books in forever. Um, you know, read a lot of Agatha Christie, read, of course, Stephen King, Peter Straub, um, Margaret Atwood, Alice Hoffman, Joyce Carol Oates. Uh, you know, every, I, I sort of like those are, if you, you ask me the, the big influence, I would say them because they have, you know, large, large bodies of work. Um, but I really, I mean, I think that, you know, readers, authors are pretty much, we're influenced by everything that we read, good and bad. Um, and I try to read widely. I read, you know, horror, but I also read a lot of, you know, mainstream fiction, um, a lot, you know, a lot of mystery, a lot of suspense. Um, so, yeah, can, influences are all over the place. If I can go off on a tangent here, you mentioned Lois Duncan. Mm -hmm. Oh, I loved the hell out of her work when I was a kid. I think I read everything that, that she put out for young adults, you know. Um, it was just this, I don't know, it was very readable with a touch of the supernatural, you know. Yes. Down a Dark Hall. Yes. <laughs> my favorite. And, and then the uh, Stranger with My it. Face. You remember that one? Vaguely, I remember the one where the kids were on the bus and got kidnapped. 
Yeah, Stranger With My Face, she's got this evil sister that she didn't know about. And, uh, yeah, and she, I believe she's the same writer who her daughter was kidnapped or something, and she felt that it was, the investigation was botched, and she wrote a, a book about it later. You know, really? Who, who kidnapped my daughter. I'm pretty sure that was Lois Duncan. Oh, huh. I'll have to look that up. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, what a strong person to live through what I consider might probably be the worst thing in the world. Yes. And still stay strong and keep working, you know. But, um, but yeah, she's a great writer. Um, you wrote on, let's see, this is ladiesofhorrorfiction.com. Mm -hmm. um, looks like this is a blog tour. And yes. mm -hmm. uh, I think this was the first post, but I'm not sure. Anyway, here's a post, here's a, a post from you titled The Power of Women Writing Horror. Mm -hmm. And it starts off with the default is male always from crash test dummies to superheroes to medical research subjects half the population is regular regularly shunted to the back burner um can you talk about that a little bit because you know i i'm a, empathy is a great thing and i think it's one of the best qualities that anyone can have and at but at the same time if you don't experience something for yourself Sometimes maybe you think you know what that's like, or maybe you dismiss it subconsciously. Whereas the people who have to go through that every day, it's a huge thing for them, and you have to open up your eyes to that. Yeah. You know, so can you talk about that a little bit more? That the what you talked about in that essay, and what some of the challenges you've had as a as a female writer and reader. Sure. Well, um, I mean, honestly, I was I. I don't know what, you know, I was when I was coming up with ideas for the article, it was actually fairly simple. And then I fell into the rabbit hole of the internet reading about crash test dummies and realizing <laughs> that um, my husband and I are in a car, same car, same seat, same seatbelt. We get hit in, in an impact that causes the same amount of, you know, force on us. I will probably be hurt worse because the seatbelt is not designed to fit me. It's designed to fit. I, I can't remember what the stats are, but it's, 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 it's a male physique. And that's just, you know, they're starting to do some work with other, you know, sh like differently shaped crash test dummies that, that would, you know, emulate a, a woman and a child. But these are things that, we all kind of walk through the the world really not not paying attention to if we don't need to but um i mean any woman can tell you you know at night most men okay if you travel to a new city you may want to go out at 10 o'clock at night to a restaurant and get something to eat you'll you'll do it without thinking right. with a woman it's different because there is a there is a whole different well you know, where am I going to be walking? Where am I? And it's just, we travel through the world. We see the world through a different lens. And unfortunately, the default is male. So when you try to describe it, a lot of times men are like, well, you just go. You just, just well, well, no, because it's not how it works when you're a woman, unfortunately. Um, you know, heart with, with, with horror and writing, I see, frequently I see lists of, oh, best books of the year, my favorite authors, my favorite stories. And a lot of times there'll be like a list of five or 10 and there might be one woman on the list. And if it is, it's Shirley Jackson yeah. or it's Anne Rice. It's someone who, okay, so, so right. I get that Shirley Jackson was phenomenal, but there are other women writing horror who have been writing horror so it there's there's a visibility issue um i see it all the time i mean even now i saw it the other day on twitter somebody was talking about authors or or facebook you know saw it very quickly and just kind of rolled my eyes because it, it's so common and i don't think people even think about it they don't it's just oh well these are these were my favorite stories and if you say well did you have any favorite stories written by a woman? Well, then people will, well, they get the feathers ruffled because, well, how dare you see, like, I didn't mean anything by it. And this and that. It's like, exactly, exactly. 
Yeah, that's the point. It's yeah. until un, until you actually think about it and, and maybe challenge yourself and say, well, okay, until you realize that the list that you have posted is, wow, overwhelmingly like white male. And and maybe take take a step back and say, well, just, what does that say about my reading? Am, am I not, you know, am I not reading as widely as I think I am? And, and honestly, I think that most of us aren't. You know, we, we tend to get our comfort zones and, and we read. But, you know, stepping out of that that comfort zone is is can only be a good thing. And I, I think that we don't do it enough. And um, yeah, I think I've gone off on a tangent. But No, so it's we, a tangent that I really wanted you to go off on. Okay. Actually, so. I, you know, I think that, that, that again, it's, you know, I see, or I see, I saw some lists of, you know, hey, these, these stories should be, you know, made into a movie. And there was another post where, and one of my stories ended up on, it was really great to see the, and not that it was my story, but there were several stories by women. Mm -hmm. But I saw something before that about, you know, hey, these stories should, you know, Netflix, you should be paying attention to this or Amazon or whatever. It was It was a little while before I saw the article and it was, everything was written by a man. And, and if you say something, then it's, a lot of times the person who came up with the list, they, they get their feathers ruffled and it's like, well, well, I just, I, or I just, I just read for quality. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't police the, the authors and this and that. I don't care about the authors. Well, exactly. Because if you don't care, the chances are very good that you are reading in your comfort zone and the default is male and the default is white male, which means you are reading the same sort of stories with the same viewpoint over and over and over again. And that creates this sort of tunnel vision as to this, this is literature and this is, this is good. And it's, it's self-reinforcing. Yes. Yeah, so and even if you're reading stories with the main character is a woman but the stories are always written by men that still because the way oh, the way most men write women and the way that women write women it, it's it's different it even you know and there are there are several you know male authors who they do it very very well um i think that paul tremblay writes um female characters very very well i thought that mallory and bird box i thought josh mallerman did a great job so, but just, just to throw those two out there, but you have lots of other writers who their version of women is, is uh, people will say, okay, well, this, this is a, you know, this is the way, this is, this is a good female character. And then you have, oh, these are not realistic. Well, but if your, if your default is only by, you know, a, a certain, by men, writing women, then yes, you're going to think that maybe women written by women maybe are unrealistic because we have a, we have a different viewpoint. We have a different experience. So we bring that to the table in our characters. Oh, you know, even say as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, if since we're Lovecraftian stuff here, if you look at the old anthologies, it's always the same male authors. And that's because yeah. one of their buddies was editing it, and their buddy contacted all of his friends who he knew was writing, and they were all these same authors. And then the next guy would edit an anthology, he'd get the same list. Yes. Because that's who they knew, and it was – it takes effort to make the stretch out. Yes, well, it does. Uh, I think that there has been some indication of perhaps turning of the corner, at least in our tiny little niche – over the last 10 years that there is more uh, varied types of authors and types of stories being written but it's taken I think a great deal of effort on the part of editors and uh, people mentioning to editors that this was even an issue it you know there, it, it is better but it's still it's still I mean every week at, at least I see you know, oh, favorite books or what I'm reading or this and that, and, and it is overwhelmingly, you know, white male. Now, now let's be honest. I mean, I'm married to a white male, okay? I have nothing against white men. <laughs> let's be very clear. But it's, it is one viewpoint, and the right. world is much bigger, and their stories are different. 
So to be, I think to be more well read, you need to read the stories from different viewpoints. And especially as a writer, it's, it's just going to help you, you know, see the world from a bigger lens, which is just going to help you with writing and, and creating your stories. And, um, you know, it's not a sit down and say, oh, well, now I need to write this story from a female point of view because, you know, it's a checkbox. It, it's not right. like that. But maybe, you know, even if you never write any other main character except, you know, a white guy, but maybe your other characters will be better, stronger, more realistic, you know, or, or maybe. And not just females who are who fit into that victim slot and that's it. Yes, yes, you know. because for a very long time, you know, women were either a wife, a mother, a girlfriend, or the victim. Yeah, and this you made know, the um, this made they were the victims, so this made the the man stronger and emerge as a hero or whatever because he's exactly. dealing with this trauma. Yes. yes. And you not know, that that the dead girl. Not that the there's anything wrong with it, but doing it over and over and over, there's something wrong with that. The story's been told. Yeah. The story has been told. We you know, we don't need to have any more stories where the woman suffers a really awful death to create this, to create the, the backbone of the story for a white guy who then, you know, swoops in, kills all the bad guys, is redeems himself, you know, or, or heals himself. And I mean, the story's been told. We don't need it again. And yet, you find, you know, they remade Death Wish, and I'm pretty sure that's the premise of that. <laughs> I had no. They remade that a couple of years ago, and I'm like, Do, we don't need that anymore. I like Bruce Willis, but I was like, come on, I've I've read this story, you know, I've yeah. seen the story. I mean, okay, I, I I think this is all very important, um, but we do want to know more about you and your writing. <laughs> so okay. we do. I, I, like, um, <laughs> oh, I just think like some authors will something will happen and it will influence them. And the story grows out of a little germ. Okay, so this dead uh, girl society, how did that, what was the germ of the idea or did something happen or you read something caught your eye that sort of suddenly evolved into this story? Is that how it works um, for you? No, it actually, it was the, um, the like, I had this image of a woman getting um, a, the little, when, when girls, there used to be uh, the best friends forever necklaces, their little heart necklaces, and, and they break into right. their two pieces. And so you wore one and your, your BFF wore the other half. So I had this, this, you know, mental picture of this woman getting half of a necklace in the mail. And this happens in the first couple pages. These are not spoilers. And then, um, then I had this vision of the same woman as a young girl sitting in, in a dark room with candles and her and her friends were chanting red lady red lady show us your face and so from there i wanted to know who the red lady was why they wanted her to show her their you know show uh, them her face again and, that is so great damien <laughs> i love that line <laughs> it was fun it was uh it you know that it was it was fun to write and the girls and then i wrote you know their I started with the first chapter, which is set now, and then I went back and I wrote the entire past timeline, which takes place in 1991, because I wanted to know what happened with these girls. And then I came back and, um, and, and I mean, the, the novel's told in alternating then and now, or now and then chapters, but I told myself the, the back story first, the, the full story. At so uh, Tor.com, you wrote, um, in my novel, The Dead Girls Club, I gave a group of 12-year-old girls the freedom to talk about serial killers, to sneak into an empty house, to spit into a bottle of wine that would be consumed by a parent, mm -hmm. to acknowledge and harness the power of girls both dead and alive. Um, my bottles of wine, I'm going to start putting a cap on those so my son doesn't spit into them, but mm -hmm. <laughs> was that a thing? what spitting into bottles of wine <laughs> no um just if I, I hate my parents type thing yes yes i don't <laughs> want to give anything away no yes. no yeah yeah um and i saw somewhere else where you wanted to make sure that the the protagonist you didn't want her voice today in present day to be the same voice in 1991 where it's not just a 
uh, an adult version of that character like it is in the present day, but it's a character without that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, and I, there, it's very different. It was like writing two different characters. Um, but like I said, I went back and I wrote the beginning and then I wrote the past. And, and as I started writing, her voice came out as a child, as, as a 12 year old girl. And it was very different from her as an adult. So, um, it, it actually, it, it got easy. And then when I went and wrote the present timeline, it was like this, yeah, her voice is completely different because she, you're not the same person at, you know, nearly 40 that you are when you're 12. So for me to have the same voice would have felt, um, would have felt, would have rung false because she wasn't. And, and what happened the summer that she was of 1991, that summer that she was 12, changed her completely so that's even more so i mean it, it is it's a it's a coming of age story and it's a coming of age story with girls and uh, girls at 12 are very different from boys and for the most part if you say hey and i did see it a, a couple months ago what's your favorite coming of age story people are going to say stand by me they're going to say it they're going to say boy's life boys because right. we think coming of age and the default is male. So we think of boys, we think of, of their childhood and, and, but girls have really rich, dark childhoods as well. And, and there are a lot of things that girls talk about, um, you know, and, and a lot of things that I think that a lot of people don't want to hear. I mean, the girls talk about periods in the book and I figure if this makes people queasy, well, half the population has one. So get over it. <laughs> It, it's it's you know biased. boys, boys oh. go through what some might consider to be embarrassing things in puberty too you know right so, so. Uh, I, mean, I mean it's it so i wanted to the girl my the girls they they talk about lots of things they talk about um they talk about everything except boys because the 12 year old girls in my novel are 12 year old girls they are not interested in boys and i didn't want it to make i didn't want to make it a oh this is a book about you know uh, girls going through puberty and angsting about boys. There's enough of that. No, these, these are about four girls who go through some some pretty extreme stuff one summer. There's I, actually, I, in my, I am blanking on the exact phrase or name or whatever it is of a book or a story about girls or women, but they're talking only basically about boys or men. Um, oh, the, the 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 test, the the the. Yes, something like that. Bechdel, Bech, Bech, Bech. something like that. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's. Is it Bechdel, Bechdel, something? Yeah. Yes, that's exactly what it is. I'm, I'm at it. Um... Yeah, that is. It's not just enough to be to have quality stories about girls where girls are the protagonists, but it can't be. They're the protagonists, that's, and the only thing they're talking about are boys or men. You know. Uh, okay. Yeah. What's interesting to me is I remember when I was in eighth, eight years old, I was in second grade. One of the scholastic books I got was called The Middle Sister. And it's about a family, a frontier family moves from Ohio to Minnesota. And she is always worried that she's a coward and her uncle works at the circus and he's got a lion tooth on a necklace. And uh, she thinks it will give her courage. And she asks him, what does she have to do to get it? And she says, he says, your apple tree in the back you have to make me a tart from your apple tree and then I'll trade it to you. But they're moving. So then it's up to her to move her apple tree, to plant it, to protect it from a locust assault, to protect it from Indians. And it's just about this little girl. It's not like her brothers are helping her or her father's doing it or her mother. It's just like, she's out there fighting the locusts by herself, you know, keeping them off her tree. It was really there. There are not many stories I can think of like that. That I that was like just readily available to boys or girls. I don't know how I picked it up, but I really remember enjoying it. It's not like these stories can't be enjoyed by everybody. You just got yeah. to find them. Yes, and that's the thing. If we expose kids from a young age to stories with all different protagonists, then the default no longer is male. The, the default is just, it's human in all its varieties so that, you know, they realize, oh, girls can be superheroes. And, you know, 
um, black men and women can be superheroes. Asians can be superheroes. Like this, it, it is not the superhero is not just Superman. You know, white guy, dark hair, blue eyes. Like, and that's important because there are a lot more. There are a lot of people in the world. We're not all, you know, um, male with black hair and blue eyes. It's really or brown hair and blue, whatever Clark Kent had. You know, I'm thinking of the cartoons when and you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but. It's, it's nice to be able to see yourself. Um, and it's really good for kids to see themselves. God, another great story. There's an essay. I don't know if you read it. You can find it online. Victor Laval wrote an essay about Into the Spider-Verse and how he took his kids to the movies. Mm -hmm. And he came out. He was practically crying because it was like that walk in the morning when by all the friends of the baseball basketball court that was him in the morning going to school you know and now that kids would have nothing it was like nothing for them to think that they could be spider-man yes and he said so like you know you may have been made for my kids but like i'm the one who loves you <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. it was a really moving essay i have to say uh Matt, well worth reading your, your cord keeps rattling or something your headphones whatever uh, i'm doing that to annoy you okay it's it's working hey um <laughs> Damien, Michael DeBronzo on the live chat has a question for you. Okay. Uh, he wants to know, what, what was your inspiration for the story, All the Pieces We Left, All the Pieces We Leave Behind? And he said it's a great story. Um, I know the title. I, I, <laughs> You've just written terrible. too much. <laughs> uh, it, it's the truth. Um, all right, give me two seconds. Hold yeah, on. no, no problem. I was like, I, I'm not sure which collection it's in. I, I know the title. You know, it's like, it's like Joe Pulver. He always told me that when he writes the story and sends it in and it gets published, published, he immediately forgets all about it, you know, because he's on to the next thing. So I was like, yeah, I can, I can see how you did that. How yeah. you could do that, um, I mean. Ah, okay, so this is the one. Um... You know, this one was a was the whole concept of um, good and evil, and and how how we're influenced, and how you know how you say good morning to someone, and maybe they're having a really awful morning, and suddenly maybe you haven't fixed their morning, but you've made them feel a little bit better, and then maybe you know they don't go home and snap at their husband or their child that maybe they find, you know, they smile. It's that like how smiles are contagious and, and yeah. happiness can be contagious and kindness. Um, and, and so I played with the whole concept of, well, can, you know, I mean, obviously negativity can, you know, can pass that along as well. So yeah, it was just, it was a play on that, that concept. And I feel really terrible that I had to look it up, but yeah, oh, I guess, you, I guess I've just reached the point where, I have a lot of stories and some I can, some I remember more than others and some I really have to stop and think because I know that, um, I know from the title that I wrote it, but. Yeah, well, plus I've been interviewed and people ask me a question that I should absolutely know, but since I'm in an interview, I'm on the spot, even though it's a very friendly interview, suddenly my brain completely shuts off, you know, <laughs> that's just me, but it can happen with, with certain things, you know. Well, right. it's it's sort of like coming up to somebody that you like coming up to your post your uh your mailman or your mail lady and you come up to them you recognize them in uniform but then you see them at walmart or target or whatever and you're like i should know that person but you know it's outside of that setting <laughs> yep. so and there's you know there's plus there's that anxiety you know being on an interview being you know on screen and and yeah yeah. I, have, I have like social anxiety and it extends to things like this, you know, my, you know, changing my clothes out of, you know, sweats and a, and a t-shirt and like the, the anxiety. I'm like, oh, you know, the hands are, palms are a little clammy, the heart's racing a little bit. Yeah. You know what? I've been doing this podcast for, I think, five years and I think I still get little butterflies in my stomach every time before I go on, you know. So, so you happens. need to do what Mike does on these things, uh, Damien, just don't wear pants. I don't. I, I, you know what? Uh, unlike most Sundays, I, I'm usually in jeans, but Danielle just washed my jeans and I haven't been able to find them. I'm actually wearing pajamas, so they, we're halfway there. Um, um, I have a confession. 
Yes. I changed my shirt. I'm still wearing sweatpants. <laughs> Uh, how long did it take you? To, you yeah. <laughs> how long did it take you to write uh, uh, Dead Girls Club? Uh, good question. I'm not sure. Um, I don't remember. I wrote because I when I wrote it, um, I ended up after um, my editor bought it, bought bought the you know acquired the novel. I ended up doing some major revisions to the present timeline. Uh, we made it more of a mystery with a few more twists and what was curious is that a lot of the things that we rewrote that the scaffolding was already there over right. bits and pieces. so it was really it was it was really kind of a neat process um so i don't know i probably the first draft couple months the, the very very first draft and then spent a lot of time on it after afterward you, you mentioned the two timelines <laughs> how do you handle that in the book is it does it alternate or yes. it does okay so it's yes. more like uh, now it's now then now then and yeah there are, you can you can see their you know like little call call and responses so yeah. that um there's something happening now and then you kind of get a little more insight then and and you as the story that's happening the mystery that's happening now you see what happened in 1991 you yeah. know, in bits and pieces, you see how the summer progressed and and how it ended. Like the recent uh, adaptations of Stephen King's It, it it, it doesn't it doesn't work like the novel works. The the novel goes back and forth. Right. You know, and I I liked the first one, but I I do think that it it lost a bit doing it this way. You know, I much prefer the way that you're handling it in the Dead Girls Club. Well, I think you can do that in, in the written format. I don't think you can, you know, I, I, I mean, maybe you could do that. I mean, I look at whenever I say, well, that couldn't be done. Um, there was a show on, I don't know if it was Showtime or HBO called The Affair. And it was the, his point of view and then her point of view. And so the show dealt with like the same situations but how she recalls it or how she saw it and how he saw it, it was really, really fascinating the way that, that they did it because you wouldn't think the same scene, watching it twice would be interesting, but it was because everything from, he remembered seeing her in her waitress uniform and it was short, it was a couple inches above the knee and when, you know, when her hair is like down and she's got makeup on and when she's remembering the event, her uniform is kind of dowdy it's down to the knee she didn't have any makeup on she had her hair pulled back so it's just that whole how we perceive yeah you know a, an experience and and the different points of view and i just i don't know i thought that was really really fascinating i think it'd be really fascinating to try and write um write a novel that way with this but i don't know if it might be boring as hell to a reader with the same you know this this the seeing the scene you know rehashed yeah. Although the way that, 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 in the show, it was different. Different things were highlighted, so it wasn't like, "Oh boy, I'm watching this all over again." Yeah. Well, yeah. That, that's kind of like the movie Rashomon. Okay. You know, it's it's that. basic. That's an ain't uh, an old classic from uh, Akira Kurosawa, where a samurai is traveling with his wife, and they're attacked by a bandit, and something happens, and the samurai is killed. And so then they have to find out who killed who and how. And so they interview the, the wife, the, the bandit, a peasant who happened to be hiding. And then uh, they get a medium to call up the ghost of the samurai <laughs> to say how it happened. And it's completely different, everybody's perceptions. It was, so that's, it's like an old technique. Of course- The same thing with, with eyewitnesses uh, to a crime. You ask mm -hmm. five eyewitnesses what happened you're going to get five stories a lot of the time yes. five different stories uh, just real quick I don't want to beat a dead horse but it is a good example because looking back on it now to us it's a little bit cheesy the first it, it miniseries I mean you know back in 1990 yes, 1991 with Tim, or whatever. with Tim Curry yes he was great he but, was fantastic in it yeah but they did go back and forth um, like the book did they? Okay. Yes, it's and one of the I, most, I think that one of the most powerful things about that was, you know, in, in the movie, you know, Stan kills himself in the second 
movie in the latest ones, you know, okay. at the beginning there. But in the book and in that adaptation, before anything really happens, you know, Stan and the others, they get this call to come back to Derry, and it so frightens Stanley yeah, that, yeah, he, that he, yes, that he kills himself. Yeah, that he kills himself. And immediately you're thinking as a reader, oh my God, how horrible is what I'm about to read that this guy didn't even want to go back there. Yes. You know, he King set that up perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, um, uh, you guys have any more questions for Damien? Yes, we... I, I do. Yeah. Um, so, I know that when you release a book, there's okay. It actually doesn't get into our hands till months after it left yours. Mm -hmm. And then you have to do a certain amount of work on the ground with promotions, going on podcasts. Uh, uh, if I don't know if you had a signing tour or anything like that, you know, but there are things you do to try to sell the book, but that's all work that you've already accomplished. And now the question is, what are you working on these days? Do you have anything that you're kind of chipping away at? Are you another novel, more short stories? Uh, I am, let's see, I'm in the process of turning a like 8,500, 9,000 word synopsis slash outline into a novel that is based on my short story, The Floating Girls, a documentary. So I'm taking that and, um, and turning it into a novel, which takes place five or six years after the the events of the short story. So that's what I'm working on. Are you one of those people you take one project and you just or, or get it done, or do you do you have like multiple things you kind of are sort of tinkering no, away with? I'm, I typically, I mean, I, well, I've been working on other things while I was writing the outline, but once I get into the meat of the writing and the characters start like really. With their personalities and no i i just focus on that do, do you have a, a regimen that you follow like some authors will say i get up in the morning i have a cup of coffee then i write till noon then i don't let myself check social media until then or do you have like a, a discipline that you follow i typically will get up and check social media while i'm having coffee and then once i'm caffeinated then i then i you know close the browser windows and and open the word doc and that's when i start and then i just write and until I just don't, you know, until until I feel like I'm either getting sloppy or, you know, if I'm not quite sure, you know, I you can just I don't know. I usually can tell. And then what I what I started doing, especially with the Dead Girls Club, is I would leave a scene halfway through, just stop because then it's easy to pick up the next day. There's no okay. Well, where do I go from here? Mm, um, yeah. Because because you're already there. Um, I can't remember where, because, you know, when I was like previous novel, like I would write it to the end of the chapter and I can't remember, I was an author who said that, that they did that on Twitter. And I was like, wow, that is such a good idea because then it's easy. You maybe read the last page of, of, you know, what you wrote and you're back in that scene. Yeah. I've never heard that before, but that's really good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, a couple more questions I have for you, and then we'll let you go. Okay. Um, but who are some of the contemporary writers that you've enjoyed reading, or, or and or what are some of the books that you've read in the last few months that you really really liked? Okay, in the last few months, um, <laughs> the Ten Thousand Doors of January, which is I believe it's Alex Harrow, loved that one. Um, okay. Loved Wilder Girls by Rory Power. Um, uh, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, I read My Sister, The Serial Killer, and I'm going to, hold on, I'm going to look up, um, ah, I'm going to try, I can't remember the, um, the name of the author. Let's see, I'm going to pull up. I'm cheating. I'm pulling up my That's fine. Uh, Goodreads page, which I haven't input anything since I really started packing for the move in earnest. But I do know there's there there. I try to usually throw things up, even though I'm not very good at leaving a review. Um, let's see. What else did I read? Uh, the Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead, which was amazing and disturbing and broke my heart. And everyone should read it. The Song of Achilles by um, Madeline Miller. And then I read um, Cersei. By Madeline Miller, uh, my sister, the serial killer, by um, Oyinkin Braithwaite, um, Curious Toys by Elizabeth Hand, uh, The Testaments by Margaret Atwood, 
um, let's see, Bunny by Mona Awad, which is this really, it's really hard to describe, but it was fantastic. The Girl in Red by um, Christina Henry, Paul Tremblay's Growing Things, let's see, Cherie Priest's The Toll, Chuck Wendig's Wanderers. Um, I could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, I you're, mean, you like you know, to read a lot. Yeah, yeah I do. I do. I, I read, you know, a lot. And those were just the things off the top of my head. Right now I'm reading um, The Starless Sea by Aaron Morgenstern, but it's taking a very long time because I've been very invested in doing things with the new house. And yeah. The I like that title. I'll have to look that one up too. Uh, and the last question. I, I realism, very, very pretty, you know, beautiful descriptions. Um, yeah. You've read The Night Circus. It's, it's, it's very much, you know, in the same vein. Uh, the last question I personally have for you, I, I try to ask, try to remember to ask every writer that comes on the show, and that is, what does success as a writer, as an author, mean to you personally? Um, um you know, it's it's funny. I, I would, I, that's a really hard question to answer because for me it means, you know, having a reader read my work and enjoy it. Um, it's success is not. You know, while it would be wonderful to have, you know, a nice paycheck with a couple commas, <laughs> right. um, you know, the more the merrier. <laughs> and to be able to pay that mortgage, you know, is a wonderful thing. But when somebody says, I read your book, you know, I've seen it. It's a few people on Twitter, you know, they, they added me and said, ah, oh, you know, read the Dead Girls Club and Club. It was amazing. Or they on Instagram, they posted a picture and they're like this novel, that to me, that success, because that's just a really good feeling to know that it's a very surreal feeling. Um, you know, even now you'd think that at, at, at this point, knowing that someone's reading my work um, last night at, um, at our open house, housewarming party, a friend of mine brought brought her copy for me to sign and that was so surreal i was like that's great okay this is just so strange that you know i wrote this like it, it's yeah i have moments where it, it is i it's sort of you know one of those like pinch myself because did i really write this did i really <laughs> those words did they really come from my brain um you know very surreal but no to to know that someone read the story and liked it or even if they didn't, that they that that they, you know, spent their their time, their their money, you know, time and money are things that you, you know we never have enough of. So that they that they invested that in in something that I created. That's right. success. I, I think that's a fabulous answer because that is what it's about, and obviously we'd all take all the money we can get but it, it's gravy on top of a feeling like that yes you know so okay now it seems to me like listening to you read your own work would be a great experience do you have any readings that are coming up like your a visit to a bookstore or a signing or anything that we could know uh, about i will be at politics and prose in dc in january Hold on, I can tell you the exact date. Yeah, see, I'm telling you, moving into a new house around the holidays is like everything. Uh, January 14th, I believe it is a Tuesday. Okay. Um, can we find this information at your site? I don't think it's on my, I don't have an events. Or on social, my, social on my media, um, probably. Yeah, I mean, I've mentioned it on Facebook and on Twitter. I'll, I'll mention it again as it gets closer. And your Twitter <laughs> is, is what? Hmm? Your Twitter handle is, is it your full oh, name? Oh, it is um, Damien A. Walters. Damien A. Walters, okay. Yeah, I couldn't I couldn't fit the Angelica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damien A. Oh. Walters on Twitter. Okay, yes. that's a good place to um, find out what's where, where your signings are and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, did I miss anything, guys? Do you, any other questions before we let Damien go? Or did we, did we bother her enough? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, is, is there anything else that you want to discuss? Yeah. Who, me? Yeah. Anything else you want your, your new I, legion of readers to know? I don't know. So what, wait, what have you guys been reading lately? What have I been reading lately? I'm rereading uh, Anne Rice's Interview with a Vampire because I haven't read it in like 30 years. Um, 
And is it uh, still, you know, I haven't read it in, I haven't reread it in a long time. Is it still breathtaking? Yeah, it's like I haven't, it's like I didn't read it because I read it when I was a kid, you know. Okay. And, um, uh, what else? I re, I, I reread, uh, Susan Hill's The Man in the Picture. Uh, okay. I love that story. I don't know if you've read that or not. She's I the one that wrote The Woman in Black. Right. No, I have that. I don't, I don't, I've and, not read that. And I honestly feel like The Man in the, Man in the Picture is, uh, I mean, they're both great stories. Don't get me wrong, but I honestly think that the man in the picture is, is the superior story. Okay. Oh, I don't know. Those are those I love are two of the ones. I love rereading books. Um, yeah, I mean, there's never yeah. enough. There's never enough time to read everything, and I've kind of acknowledged that. But there are books that I will, I will go back and reread. I reread. I read The Handmaid's Tale every year. Um, the Sea Dreams. It is the sky. Um, uh, by John Horner Jacobs. I read that recently. Okay. Um, you know, I have this story. bad habit of reading like four books at a time. How do you even do that? I can't. I have, <laughs> I, my, like I can read one and then another. And, but I mean, they're, they're totally different. Like right now, I'm rereading Interview with the Vampire. But I'm also reading um, John Sanford's first prey book, you know, Rules of Prey, mm -hmm. which they could not be those two could not be more different you know right. so so yeah I, I don't i don't really just read horror or lovecraftian horror or, um you know like you i read all different kinds of things mm -hmm. so all right rick what are you reading i'm reading uh max brand he's an old pulp author he did a series called the fire brand about a uh, character during the time of the forces okay seven novelettes Ooh, matt uh, okay i'm like mike every room in the house has one or two books of mine with a bookmark <laughs> in them and kind of depends on where i sit down what i pick up but i just recently got a cheap copy of leslie Klinger's annotated dracula and i had read oh, that book when i was like uh, how'd you know You're um, gonna... <laughs> Anyway, I uh, I read that when I was like 12 or 13, and it was really, frankly, beyond me. And it, I kept thinking, you know, where's Bella Lugosi? So I'm enjoying going through the history of uh, Bram Stoker and his life, and then all the annotations are just kind of making this a uh, pleasure to read. That's cool. Yeah. All right. So, so can I ask Keith? Or can oh, people absolutely. Keith is, uh, Keith is – someone I wanted to talk to for a few minutes today and he makes you've heard of precious moments he, mm -hmm. he makes precious <laughs> mutations so so this is the first time Keith's been on the show so we have to be nice to him so okay well I just want to know what he's reading <laughs> yeah what are you reading you don't have to be nice to him. Uh, right now I'm rereading um, Red Dragon okay is uh, um, I just was feeling the Hannibal Lecter phase. I have a, a piece that I want to do, kind of a, a Hannibal Lecter style, and that was so I looked to the book for inspiration and go back, read a, read up on some of the characters and get the visuals in my own head as opposed to watching the films and getting the ones, the ideas that other people have shown. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I knew there was one on the tip of my tongue that I couldn't remember. It's uh, called Imaginary Friend. I don't know if oh, I've heard of that. Steve, yes, well, it, I can't say his last. Can't pronounce his last name. It's like Stephen. It begins with a C, right? It's Stephen. Yeah, Stephen Chabosky or something like that. Okay. But anyway, his first book was The Perks of Being a Wallflower, and this is his okay, second yeah. book. And talk about 180 degree turn, you know, because this is a horror book. Mm -hmm. So. But it, I think that's wonderful. I mean, yeah. it's, it's nice to not. You know, I mean, that's the great thing about writing is, you know, you can write all sorts of stuff. I mean, I'm, yeah, that's really great. We is even, it good? It, it's yeah. very good, actually. Okay. It's very, very good. Um, okay. I, I, I'm still in the middle of it, but I highly recommend it. Okay. So, all okay. right. So the name of Damien's new novel is The Dead Girls Club. It's available uh, in print and for Kindle. Um, and, yeah. and if you are, if you're a TV person, look at it because I would love to see 
that visual of those little girls sitting in that room doing that chant. It's just so oh, that's creepy. a good that that's a good point. <laughs> that would be great. Even if we could get an audio book, you know, at the very least of those little girls are doing the chant, that would be great too. So yeah, um, I think it was four four twelve year old girls all saying, you know, red lady, red lady, show us your face. And as the chant goes on, they get faster and faster. <laughs> well, <laughs> just to the audience out there, let me just say that uh, Paul has read this book, Paul Trembley. Mm -hmm. uh, Gwendolyn, who we've had on the show, Gwendolyn Keast has read the book, loved it. Um, and there is just a whole list of people uh, that we know and, and sites that we read that have read this book and and think it's great. So so do pick it up. Um, Dead Girls Club, Damien Angelica Walters, Phelan Wong Print and Kindle on Amazon. And um, yeah, thanks for being on the show today, Damien. Appreciate oh, it. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, always glad to talk with you. I have to get you on a little bit, bit sooner for the next time. So okay. write another book, and as soon as it's about to come out, we'll get you in, on here. You know, hopefully I'll, <laughs> it won't be another three years. Hey, you can't you can't rush genius, right, Damien? <laughs> no, I can light a fire under my butt. And, you know, get the, uh, I, I recently got a new literary agent, so yeah, I need to hurry up and finish it. Finish the next novel. All right, well, um, all you have to do to close is just close the window and it'll kick you out of here so okay and uh, we'll do an audio version of this later on in the week and i'll send you that link when it's when it's ready okay that sounds so, good thank you right. so much thank you all right guys enjoy the rest bye. of your night damien you too okay bye. good night good night bye. hey guys this is keith busher uh keith rick lay and matt carpenter so hey guys how are you hi keith you got a uh, fascinating background man Yes, he does. <laughs> yes, this is the uh, this is this is only like one small corner of my laboratory, so to speak. <laughs> so, um, I'm not sure how much Mike has told you about me and what I do, but essentially, um, I collect secondhand uh, items from garage sales, thrift shops, those sorts of things, and uh, modify them into uh, recycle them, upcycle them. Uh, repurpose them into uh, collectibles for uh, a different generation. You know, not not your not your mother, not your grandmother's collectibles anymore. Something more for uh, a crowd that has been knocking these things away because they're too cutesy for them and stuff like that. So I'll turn them into monsters and pop culture things and basically whatever the piece. Yeah, so That's give give amazing. us a couple example. Give excuse me. Give us a couple of examples, um, like maybe in the horror vein that you've done. Um, so recently, uh, we went a little bit uh, crazy, part and parcel to uh, posting on on the Lovecraft Easing, uh Really seemed to get the ball rolling in a, in a lot of different articles and stuff. But um, so the big thing that everybody is gravitating towards right now is the the precious moments and stuff so we um basically take one of those and modify it i've done uh the exorcist recently i did um I'm trying to think i've done a whole bunch of it ones a lot of the necronomicon the evil dead series people like those ones uh chucky i did a there was a cake topper one that was a bride and groom and uh, I did a Chucky and Tiffany one from Child's Play. Uh, I got a couple of here that I'm just finishing up as Christmas commissions. I can show you a couple if you wanted to see them. Or... Sure. Um, and when you when you do that, uh, sure. And when you do that, um, maybe kind of describe what you're what you're holding up because um, a great many of the people who uh, listen to the show are just listening. So, on, on the way, okay. on the, like on commutes, um, things like that. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, a lot of people are very familiar with, obviously, with the Precious Moments. I think it's a North American thing. It's not quite the worldwide thing that a lot of people, um, I think, you know, the U.S. and Canada is a big Precious Moments area. Yeah. So, the one that I have is actually like an anniversary piece. So, it's a couple and they're holding a plate between them. And I've seen different variants of it. It's a little boy and a little girl. They're usually not more than like 12 years old or something in, in the piece. And uh, the ones that 
uh, I'm speaking about, uh, they're holding up a plate and it says, you know, 25 years married or 50 years married, 10 years married, whatever the celebration is, people buy them as occasions. Right. So um, somebody wanted one for her parents for Christmas, um, but she wanted it zombie theme. So um, I made the little boy a little more zombie and uh, creepy. It's actual prop movie blood that uh, people use from in movies and TV shows and stuff. Oh, wow. So uh, it doesn't dry. Uh, and uh, hello? Yep, we can still hear you. I think, okay. I think, uh, so the plate yeah. now says, I love you for your brains, as opposed to, you know, <laughs> made 25 years. <laughs> Am uh, I dropping? I can't help but asking, like, the real precious moments, people, have they given you any kind of calls? <laughs> I was wondering, <laughs> but I didn't want to ask. <laughs> I have, actually. I have spoken to them. I'm not supposed to um, discuss it necessarily publicly, but um, oh, no one's they're sure. not. I'm, we I'm won't do anything. It. <laughs> we, we will keep it quiet. So just go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, I'm still doing it. Does that tell you anything? Yes, it does. They're, That's great. They're uh, actually extremely uh, gracious, friendly, super nice people. You know, um, they uh, they can't necessarily publicly endorse me, but they they appreciate the art what I'm doing even though even though most of their clientele does not necessarily and you know um, I, I don't know how to describe it exactly without no, getting that, myself that or them in trouble but. Um, so, so each one of these is actually a unique composition so if if we get one from you it's going to be completely unique yes I don't do casting I don't do um, copies or casting or molds or anything like that uh, I, I can't manufacture. For me, I, I need to make art, and it's about making one of a kind. So yeah. if you guys were to get one from me, it would be completely unique and have my fingerprints in it, probably, and be just for whatever it was that you guys wanted, and nobody else would have something like that. I try not to repeat ideas. I get commissions, and people sure. want me to do the same idea, but I won't do the same idea on the same piece, if that makes sense. Um. Well, your your internet's not taking our show very well. So, um, before I apologize. You, no, no, no. It's not your fault. It happens. Before you go, um, how can people see more of these? Where do they go? And where do they go if they want to order one of these down the line from you? Uh. Okay. Um. We do have an Etsy shop. Um. It's Keith Busher Precious Mutations. Uh, Instagram at Precious Mutator, uh, Facebook Art of Keith Pusher Precious Mutations, um, any of the social media. I do have www.preciousmutations.com, but it just pretty much links you to my social media because I'm not uh, very computer savvy. Uh, um, uh, a sculptor who's just trying to find a way to connect to an audience. So. Uh, yeah, but so, any of those social media, if you send me a message. Yeah, so if you go to Facebook. If, if you um, send me a message through social media. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you, go to, if you go to Facebook and in the search bar type in Precious Mutations, it'll take you to Keith's page. So. Uh, yeah. And I would yeah, advise much anywhere. anywhere. Look at the Etsy shop because you can see some really glorious stuff there. There's um, There's some... The sales stuff, I've got a few cards and prints of stuff that I've done recently. Instagram's where to go if you really want to see a lot of my older work and pieces in progress, that sort of thing. So you got Instagram, is that under Precious Mutations as well? Just search for that. Uh, it's at Precious Mutator. Okay. Um, so as long as you start typing precious, and it's going to offer you probably uh, moments and me. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, do me a favor if you get time tonight or maybe in the morning. Um, send me a message with the uh, Instagram, and I don't. I can't remember if you said if you were on Twitter or not. 
I know where you are on Facebook, but send me the Instagram um, URL, and I'll make sure that that goes out with the show notes. So, so, so I guess you say you have to create art. So now you take these uh, little statues, potentially they're old or cracked or damaged. Do you actually sculpt on them, like carve off pieces that you don't want or add little bits of sculpt so it's more the shape that you want and then you paint it? Or is this all done with like with your paint? Um, no, it depends on the piece. Um, some of them um, uh, are made of material that's not as brittle, so I can sand it down. Other pieces, uh, like the precious moments, are very brittle. They're glass, so I have to sculpt on top of it. Um, hopefully, this is going through. Um, but then I add paint and stuff. I do all various sizes. I do all kinds of nutcrackers. It's not just precious moments ones that I do. I do nutcrackers and tree toppers and all sorts of stuff. So. Um. All right. Well. Um. Like I said, your your internet's not liking our internet. Could be could problem could be on my end. Doesn't mean it's your fault. Uh, but I just wanted to make the audience that, that listens really to this podcast. No, no, no. I, I this is basically what I wanted to get done is make the audience aware of precious mutations because I, I think it's such a cool idea and such an original idea. Um, and uh, yeah, great birthday gifts, great Christmas gifts. So <laughs> right. Valentine's. Yeah, Valentine's. Up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, Keith, thanks uh, for being on the show, and be sure to um, uh, send me the Instagram link when you think about it tonight or tomorrow, and I'll make sure <laughs> I'll adjust these show notes and and make sure that that goes out with it. So. Awesome. Thank Sound you good? so much for. I'm, I apologize again for the. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I'm in the garage. I have a booster and stuff, but sometimes it's... It's just one of those things that happens, you know, especially on a live show. So, yeah. all right. Thanks, man. Yeah. Good to meet you in person. More no problem. Less. Hope so, you're feeling better. Thank you. And uh, I'll probably talk to you yeah. tomorrow <laughs> or the next day. Sure. So. We'll talk more, I'm sure. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Oh, okay, sounds good. Um... Mm -hmm. All right, so a couple of things I wanted to talk about before we go, guys. Um, uh, let's see here. When we were talking about that BBC Dracula show a few episodes back. I don't right? think it's come out yet. I'm really interested mm -hmm. in seeing it. No, no, it hasn't. That's why I'm bringing it up. Um, I was thinking, okay, we're going to have to watch this on the BBC or what. And then I see an article today that... Um, it's going to be on Netflix on January the 4th. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I really can't wait because the trailer, this looks so well done, and it's by the same guys who did um, uh, Sherlock. Um, so, you know, I've got high hopes for this. Who's playing Dracula? I don't know. I haven't looked that up. Uh, good uh, question. It is... Clay Spang. I'm not making that up. I don't know how to pronounce it. But Kleiss or Clay Spang. So I'm personally really looking forward to that. Um, a few people, people made me aware of this article at, at the Smithsonian's website a few weeks ago. And the, the heading is uh, A Plea to Resurrect the Christmas tradition of telling ghost stories. Uh, though the practice is now more associated with Halloween, spooking out your family is well within the Christmas spirit. I, I remember especially in England. Um, and you can look up this article on the Smithsonian and read it. I won't bore you guys by reading the whole thing. But someone on, uh, William Holloway, I think it was, said on Facebook that we had to do something like this at Lovecraft Easy and, you know, like have Scott Thomas read a ghost story for example um so we've settled on december the 23rd it'll be myself scott thomas jeff thomas and john paget who has a stunning reading voice he's very very talented talented writer and a talented narrator uh 
course, it'll be live, but we will record it. I think we're doing it at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Monday the 23rd, but stay tuned as far as that goes. Um, I, you know, I would love, that sounds cool, but my family would not be into, like, sitting around the Christmas tree while I read them a ghost story. The closest we come every year is we watch the Mr. Magoo Scrooge. That's, that, that's, that's, why, that's, our, that's our ghost story. That's why I and the Thomas Brothers and John Padgett were going to do it for you. Okay. So, all right. that, was, that was my introduction to Christmas Carol, Mr. Magoo. <laughs> it's, it's bloody brilliant, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, it was the first version of Christmas Carol I saw as a kid. It, it, it's, it's not bad. It really sticks to it quite well. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I was surprised at how serious it was when I saw it as a kid. In other news, I was informed by the listeners tonight that whenever I hit my mute button, I'm not actually muted. So, you know, when I hit the mute button because I'm drinking Coke and they need to burp or whatever, apparently everyone's been hearing this. So, <laughs> so I think that's as bad as it got. I don't think I yelled at my pets or anything while the mute button was going on, but who knows. Um, anyway, that's kind of funny. Um, iHorror.com and other websites. Here's a headline. Game of Thrones showrun showrunners creating Lovecraft film for Warner Brothers. I posted about this at the Lovecraft Ezine page, the one that has about 230,000 followers, and boy did I get a lot of responses. And I think like half of them were like, wow, this is a great idea, and the other half were something along the lines of, they fucked up Game of Thrones, we're not going to let them, they shouldn't be doing Lovecraft. And of course, we did get the inevitable comment from a couple of people, oh my god, these guys are going to destroy Lovecraft, destroy Lovecraft stories, which, no, I don't think they're going to rewrite the stories, it's just a movie. So, I, you take that however you want. I'm not going to pass well, judgment until I see hey, the movie. Well, let's be careful here. Everyone says they ruined it. I mean, come on. People were watching it by the millions. It had stunning visuals, great acting, intriguing oh, I, I plot know, line. So it's like, okay, now yeah, you know I that the, the, I dismiss comments like that. I don't really think about them. The, the visual media is not the written media. Right. So it's it's very hard to take some of Lovecraft's stories and depict them. Mm -hmm. For all we know, they're going to take some ideas and run with them in a completely different direction. Yeah. Uh, Dia Farb is different than Richard Stanley's Color Out of Space is different than the book, but it doesn't mean you can't enjoy all of them. Yeah, and much the same as I'm, I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings book books, but you know the BBC audio play adaptation takes a bit of a different direction. It can't include everything, even though it's 13 hours long. And the movies change some things too, but you know, it's okay to enjoy all three versions of this story. Um, and as far as any Lovecraft adaptations are going, going I, I mean, I, I, I just see all this stuff as premature. People really get all worked up about it, but until the movie is out and you see it, you know, it could be great, it could be crap. Wait to see it, and then you'll find out. So, um, oh, I believe we all just read The Outsider recently, right, guys? Stephen I Adams. haven't read it yet. Okay, Stephen King's The Outsider, good novel. Um, Matt, it's coming to... Oh, God, HBO. HBO, HBO, yes, thank you. It's coming January to HBO 15th. as a mini series on January the 12th. We're going to get some good TV to watch in January, man. I wonder how that will work for visual media. I don't know, but I've seen the trailer, and I like what I see so far at any rate. So, all right. That's I why mean, I, I have to read it soon. Yeah, it's, I mean, it, I, th I liked it. I'm um, just behind on reading. Now, we all? Now, now, Matt, what you're just saying about translating... To me, this is going to be a tough one. I don't remember if we talked about this or not, but it fits in with this this discussion. Uh, they're going to do the same thing with Stephen King's 
well, it's going to be a movie, I think, from a Buick 8. I, I really love that book, but I just don't see, and I'm not criticizing, but I can't, I can't visualize how they're going to visualize it. You know what I mean? It didn't really have a third act. And that's not a uh, criticism. It's one of those it's one of those stories where like not, nothing much nothing much happens but you enjoy it anyway. That's like the Colorado kid. Yeah. And when they yeah. tried to turn that into a TV show, they well, they screwed it big time. Um I I don't know. I I'm with you, Mike. This is a book that I like. But that's the thing about sometimes visual artists can really pull it off. Um, just I, I know, for example, his Dark Materials, Philip Pullman's original book didn't appeal to me. Mm -hmm. I read it, and it was like, okay, when I read it, I don't know, what is it, like 30 or something, 40? I don't know. It was ancient history. And uh, it was not – it was written for, like, younger people than me. And so I didn't particularly enjoy it. And then the first movie came out, and it was fair. And now this adaptation comes out. I'm loving it. You know, yeah, you I just noticed don't know. I, I temporarily got HBO because Kelly and Ben were telling me to watch Watchmen, which I'm doing. I noticed his dark materials on there, so I'll have to check that out. It's really enjoyable. I think Danielle would like it. Uh, Logan might like it. It's okay. not – there's some dark subject matter, but there's not a lot of gore. There aren't jump scares. It's more like suspenseful, yeah. and uh, interesting mysteries are going on. So I, I, I think that a lot of people would enjoy that. You know, let's be honest. Some of Lovecraft stories don't read very well, and right. maybe a visual artist can take it and make it into a more compelling story. It, it's not. Are they going to take one of the big blockbusters like? The shadow over Insmith and adapt that, or are they going to take some little story? Or are they going to take a monster and use the monster in something original? I guess until we see it, yeah. What are we going to say? Well, um, I wanted to let everyone listening know that Jeff Thomas has a new book out. Uh, it's called The Unnamed Country, um, and it's available for Kindle and in print. And um, I'll read this last paragraph. From Jeffrey Thomas, the creator of Punk Town, comes the unnamed country, a mosaic novel weaving tales of a land and people poised between the ancient traditions of the past and the burgeoning technology of the future, where devils, gods, and ghosts still haunt the land and where you might just discover a unicorn. But frankly, I mean, they had me at Jeff Thomas in the unnamed country. So I, I think most everyone, probably anyway, listening to me right now is familiar with Jeff Thomas. But yeah, pick this book up and read it because it's. I'm wait, he, Jeff sent me one in the mail. It hasn't arrived yet, but I just. I know Jeff, and it's going to be damned good. So. Um, so there's that. Um, oh! Oh! God! The guys, the wonderful guys, I love these guys, at the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, they sent me another one of these, and if you're listening later, what I'm holding in my hand is, it looks like a book, um, but it's H.P. Lovecraft, The Collected Fiction, an audio book by the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. Now, the first one that they gave me a couple years ago was every single one of Lovecraft's stories read by these guys, Andrew Lehman. Uh, Sean Branny and these guys are very very good and they even have these little like library card looking things inside and it comes with a very nice um, thumb drive which has a silhouette of Lovecraft anyway this one here that they just sent me is I think all the collaborated tales so at long last one of my favorite Lovecraft stories which was probably 25% Lovecraft and 75% R.H. Barlow, um, The Night Ocean. This is a great reading of The Night Ocean. I think and I think Andrew Lehman does the does that reading. Um, so I highly recommend going to the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society's website and picking these up. I mean, you, you can listen to Lovecraft stories for free on YouTube or, or whatnot. 
but these are uh, these are a couple pegs above that. These are great. Um, so there's that. Um, I think that's about it. Um, Rick told me before the show that uh, Castle Rock, the ending was good but not great. Right, Rick? You're you're muted. Apparently, your mute button button works. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Some the phone rings. So oh, oh, okay. Um, it, it, this has basically been misery meets Salem's Lot, and there have been two sort of plot lines, and I think they wrapped up misery plot line very well, and they left some things kind of hanging. Or at least you, you didn't know what happened in the aftermath to a lot of these Salem's Lot uh, characters. But I think that's going to be picked up in the third season. Okay. Um, I think that's about it. Other than, other than to say, for all the comic book fans out there, I don't think you two are interested because... Rick, you haven't, you, you never read the original Crisis on Infinite Earths, or at least you haven't yet. But man, I had big hopes about this, and the writers have just really let, let us down, so. And big wasted opportunity with Brandon Routh, Superman. He's not, he's not in there nearly enough, so. Okay, speaking about audio presentations, mm -hmm. uh, we never have talked about it on the show, maybe we should. The BBC did an adaptation of Charles Dexter Ward, except it wasn't really. It wasn't really just a retelling of the story; they went on with it to insert um, a more international mystery, and it ended up completely different. It was set in the modern days. Right, and the went, one that came out a few months ago. Okay, yeah. it's not to say that it was. So some people might object, like you, you say, some people say, you, you touched my precious story. Yeah. But still, as a work of its own, it was very enjoyable. I liked the heck out of it. Well, they're now doing one for The Whisperer in Darkness. Yes. So if uh, you're interested, that's just another thing you have to listen to. Um, takes a lot less effort than picking up these heavy books and opening the pictures. You get a paper cut. So... I'm yeah, sure. Dangerous. I'm sure that the Whisperer in Darkness is going to be great because uh, the case of Charles Dexter Ward was. So, and again, that's at uh, that's at the BBC. Both of those are. So, I think it's BBC yeah. Four. Yeah, something like that. You know, even even the Lovecraft Historical Society takes liberties, as sure in their their movie version of Whisper in Darkness, which they they made it like a universal uh, horror movie. Or even their audio dramas. One of my favorite stories, uh, The Shadow Out of Time, in their audio adaptation, they added a ship's doctor that the protagonist tells his story to. You know, it was an ingenious way to tell the story in that format. So, um, not all change is bad. Or in Call of Cthulhu, they added a couple of detectives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, next week I think we have uh, Alan Baxter. So, and then again on the twenty third. Stay tuned as to the exact time. On the twenty third, we'll be reading ghost stories. Um, I believe at nine p.m. Eastern, but we'll nail that down. And as you've long got as a prize. Scott, yeah, and uh, remember, as long as Scott reads everything, we're going to be okay. Um, That's true. Not that I don't like your voice, Mike. Okay, I don't so think the, I'll read much. John and okay. John and Jeff and Scott have great reading voices. So the prize is a signed hardcover copy of Weeping Season by Sean O'Connor. It's not Lovecraftian, but it is the uh, unnerving horror uh, with uh, an unexpected twist at the end that I think most people would like. If you want a copy, easingprizes at gmail dot com. And put whisper, uh, put uh, weeping in the, the subject heading. And he'll randomly draw somebody. Um, not everyone gets one. <laughs> Just right. wanted to point that out. Uh, I like that cover a lot too, by the way. Yeah, it's creepy. Yeah. 
so anyway um alan baxter next week um matt and rick thanks for being here um kelly and ben and pete abandoned us so they won't get paid this week um <laughs> And everyone, thanks for listening. I we really appreciate it, and a special thanks to uh, the patrons um, who uh, keep me financially afloat. So, uh, thanks everyone, and we will we will see you next week.